Welcome everyone to Dropkick Discussions presented by Sports Kita. I'm your host, Corey Guns, along with Sports Kita's wrestling expert, Tom Colohue. And on this week's episode, we're going to talk extreme rules results, major raw rewrites, plus we answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter, and of course, much more. And I can promise you this episode will have a clean finish. Unlike most of the matches we saw this past Sunday at Extreme Rules, which is where we'll start tonight. Tom, first let's just talk about your overall thoughts of the show as a whole. You know, I'll I'll just come out and say it as a fan. I thought the show was bad. Uh, I, I, I'll stop short of saying it was terrible because I thought that the in-ring action was pretty good for the most part. But... Just the booking and, like we alluded to, the finishes of the matches and the swamp fight that wasn't really a fight and just all different things. It just it just seemed a little wonky, and I really thought that for a pay-per-view, it was not the best showing uh, for the WWE. And I, I think we're a show that, you know, it's in vogue sometimes to bash the WWE, but I feel like on this show, we give credit where credit's due, and, you know, we're not one to critique the WWE just because it's cool to do but you know at the same time I do think that uh, a little bit of criticism is probably warranted uh, for what we saw on the horror show at Extreme Rules what do you think if we have Extreme Rules and look at it as competing with the rest of the WWE shows this year I think this was the weakest show this year if we then look at it and examine it competing with the New Japan Cup and Dominion look at it as competing with Slammiversary it was a failure. And that is a real shame because the quality of wrestling was very, very high. Seth versus Ray, Sasha versus Asuka, they were particularly impressive. But even the tables match, I felt, was a really great use of 10, 15 minutes at a constant high pace. There was actually some smart booking. Dolph versus Drew to try and convince people that Dolph actually stood a chance by letting Dolph have his stipulation. But then, of course, he lost. So that's <laughs> that's a thing. It, it didn't work, I don't think, but they tried their best when it came to actually convincing us of something. Some of the finishes, though, painful. I'm also really not there for the Swamp Fight. This is just me personally. There were some moments I did enjoy, most notably Alexa Bliss and a, just like a guy on fire. But the constant shaky cam, the smash zooms in and out, and the cuts were jarring. My eyes aren't the best. Most people who've watched me on YouTube know I wear glasses, and I felt really dizzy by the end of it. So the show at times was difficult to sit through yeah and i wanted to dive into some of the particulars uh of the show itself and kind of look at some particular matches and let's start there with the swamp fight that you were just talking about i too and with you i wasn't a huge fan of it i think as far as cinematic matches go it was probably better than the firefly funhouse match but not as good as the boneyard match at wrestlemania but according to reports, one person that did seem to like it was Vince McMahon. And apparently, you know, he, he loved the Swamp Fight, and we know that his opinion probably is really the only one that matters in the company. And on the same hand, we hear that he hated the eye for an eye match, which for my money was actually the best match on the show. It had the most ridiculous stipulation attached to it, but I thought that Rollins and Mysterio put on one of, if not the best match on the card, even the, the stipulation notwithstanding. What can you tell us about Vince McMahon's reaction to both of these matches at Extreme Rules? Well, I think the stipulation to the eye for an eye really worked against it. They should really have just let these two guys wrestle because they're basically made to wrestle each other. Now, you say there were reports of Vince loved the Swamp Fight. That's me. I'm reporting that. And it was his idea to have the match. It was his idea to have a CGI-enhanced finish. So the match was recorded first before they went live. That also meant they had time to clean up the uh, the vomit before any matches started and like sanitize the steps, you know, because they didn't want chunks of eye lying about. <laughs> now, apparently Vince um, uh, cut the whole thing as regards the actual finish. There was a whole CGI enhanced finish. The editing team were working on it even during the show. And he decided literally during that show, he didn't want it anymore. It didn't live up to his expectations. He's, so it, even while the show was ongoing, he didn't like it, so it was cut. A lot of people thought the match was live because it said live in the top right corner, but WWE paid attention to everyone on social media who spotted and worked around that. 
Now, as regards the Swamp fight, yeah, Vince thought it was great. He loves what Bray Wyatt is doing right now. And Vince is a fan of those old horror movies that a lot of this is inspired by. Some people didn't like it. It certainly was divisive. wasn't as popular as the Boneyard or the Money in the Bank match. And I think Bray Wyatt, unfortunately, has been quite divisive recently. But for fans of Bray Wyatt, this has been tremendous. And even though they, it was supposed to be a lot more action packed than the Five Life on House, Bray himself wasn't that involved in the action until very late on. It told a story. It just looks like, as with many other things, it was a story that won't actually reach its peak until later. That was the pro- That was the problem with Extreme Rules. The actual peak, the crescendo of all the storylines, just comes after. It's like um, playing Mario and the princess is always in another castle. <laughs> you just felt like we didn't get any sort of payoff. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, the, you know, the pay-per-views historically have always been the place where feuds kind of reached their climax. And like we got the payoff at the end at the pay-per-views. It, usually it's not the pay-per-view that are lead-ins to future episodes of Raw and SmackDown, which is kind of what it seemed like we got this past Sunday. Speaking of that... We saw in this past Monday's Raw that you know we are eventually going to get a rematch between Sasha and Asuka for the Raw Women's Championship. And the Sasha-Asuka match at Extreme Rules was one of those matches where it was just a weird finish. Just didn't make a, a whole lot of sense, even from a kayfabe standpoint, you know, if you want to call it that, with Bailey being the official. And I also thought it was weird that they did this not too long after they did the weird... MVP Apollo Crews did he forfeit the U.S. title did he not segment and then we get this did she win it did she not type of conclusion to this match I'm hearing though that the finish to this match as well was changed last minute and that maybe that is why this match came off a little bit wonky because this wasn't the originally intended finish uh, before the show went air what can you tell us about some of the changes that were made to the Sasha Oscar match at Extreme Rules. This was supposed to be a clean loss for Sasha Banks, even though undoubtedly Bailey and Kyrie Sane would have had something to do with it. Now, the finish was changed at the last minute. It was literally changed on the day. A couple of changes were made to Extreme Rules in the lead up to the event, notably taking matches off of the card to keep it from getting too long. Then they added a match because the Swamp Fight wasn't as long as they expected once it was edited down. And then they moved a couple of matches to give the next two weeks on Raw and SmackDown some big rematches. The company really aren't focused on pay-per-views in the COVID era. They're much less valuable than they normally are. Used to be, time was as it were, that they could charge extra for pay-per-view tickets because pay-per-views were the culmination of storylines. That hasn't been the case in the current climate because they're working out of the same place with no fans. With this in mind, and in addition to this, with the network being less profitable now because of the new big money deals from the USA, from Fox, The focus has been entirely on making sure those ratings are maintained. And so I worry that SummerSlam will actually suffer from much the same fate, where essentially it's a commercial. You should watch Raw tomorrow. You should watch SmackDown on Friday instead of really finishing up. And I think this was a step towards that, removing the clean finish that was planned and just trying to keep you tuning in the next night on Raw. Now, I mentioned the similarities between this match and the Apollo Crews MVP match that never happened. Crews was going to defend the U.S. Championship against MVP. Turned out that they announced on the show that he wasn't medically cleared to compete, and so they did the quote-unquote forfeit uh, for MVP. And on the show, and I even put out a tweet about it during the show, it sounded like even the announcers weren't exactly sure if this was a legitimate forfeiture and MVP was the new champ or if Apollo Crews was still actually the champ and MVP had just kind of confiscated the title and ran away with it. The the Asuka Sasa match, you can kind of tell that that was the finish, but this segment was really weird to me because it really felt like even the announcers weren't exactly sure how this was supposed to play out. Now, in the time since Extreme Rules, it's come out... Uh, or reportedly rumored that maybe the reason Cruz didn't make the show is that he's tested positive for COVID-19. What can you tell us about that? And then I also want to ask you about uh, MVP moving forward as U.S. champ. But first, what can you tell us about Cruz's medical status right now? Well, Cruz's medical status is Cruz's business. 
If he was injured, that's a different story because that only affects him and it isn't stigmatized because of possible spreading. But I think it's irresponsible right now for so many dirt sheets to state that anyone has COVID. For me, it just comes across as an obvious guess. Oh, he wasn't there. It was a last minute change. He clearly has COVID. There is no evidence to support that at the moment. And until there is, or at least until Apollo Crews decides to say one way or the other, whether he does or doesn't have it, that's not something I really want to be discussing because I don't think that's fair on him. As regards MVP as the US champ, he is not the US champ. The new championship title is not actually the new championship title as of yet. Not until Apollo Crews beats MVP and decides to essentially take that championship and retire the previous one. The United States championship right now is still the one in the possession of Apollo Crews. At the same time, MVP is working hard to build this new stable. He's doing a lot of good things for a lot of people, which I think is really benefiting them as individuals and is really holding a division around himself at the moment. When Cruz does return, he was meant to be cleared for Extreme Rules. He was meant to be cleared for Raw. It really will be a matter of time, but he won't be on next week because that was filmed last night. Sorry, it was filmed at the same time as last week's, well, as this week's installment of Raw anyway, so we won't see him for next week because that's been pre-recorded. When he does return, I'm sure they will then be able to explain what's happened with the US title But at the moment, there is a clear plan for the WWE. That whole segment was written really last minute, really rushed. They just did the best they could with it. And the fact that they didn't really have the US champion available. Apollo Crews is still the US champion. What do you think of MVP's new stable that he's got? I was, for me, I was super excited to see Shelton Benjamin a part of the stable and hopefully just being given something to do, being given a role, because I think he's a guy that's very underutilized on the roster right now. So I was excited to see him win the 24-7 championship and and, and be a part of this new group that MVP has put together. What do you think just of the presentation Monday of MVP and Lashley and Benjamin together as a unit? There is a lot of very talented people working with MVP right now, not just in the stable, but as his opponents. I think he's doing great things. Shelton Benjamin is really benefiting from this, even though he's lost a number of matches against Apollo Crews recently. He's someone who I really have a high opinion of. I was covering WWE in November last year in the UK, and I was at the same hotel in Manchester as the WWE talent. And I remember the bus went for Raw, the bus went for SmackDown, and then I saw Shelton Benjamin come down and and sit in the bar. And I felt that was a real shame. He should at least be there even just in a coaching capacity, but he apparently just wasn't needed, so they left him behind, but still flew him out to the UK. I think he's a very talented man, and I think Bobby Lashley is a very talented man. When you look back to the whole wedding storyline with Lana, it's a very different Bobby Lashley to what we have right now. MVP has done great work in rehabilitating Lashley, and even though I do feel Lashley could have got there on his own, MVP should take a lot of credit for that. I'm very happy with the building of this faction. I'm very happy with what he's doing around the United States Championship and really making it feel like a big deal. And I'm really happy with the choices he's making as regards the talent he's working with. Last thing I want to talk about at Extreme Rules before we move on is the Drew McIntyre Dolph Ziggler match. I mentioned on the podcast before that I'm a big fan of Dolph Ziggler. I think he's another guy that is criminally underutilized maybe underrated but definitely i think they could do more with him uh than what they than the roles they seem to find for him and he has this match with drew mcintyre you know where he names the stipulations right before the match and i know we've talked about the term of being buried before and we and we've talked about that that gets overused and that i think think there are some people who don't really understand what the term buried means in the wrestling business so maybe you'll take me to task for this but Am I the only one who thought that Ziggler got buried in this match? Because, again, as a wrestling fan and and maybe using kayfabe, they threw everything at Drew McIntyre, and Ziggler just has the advantage the whole time. He's putting Drew through a table. He's using steel chairs. You know, he hits the zigzag, you know, which is supposed to be his finisher. And at the end all it takes is a kip up and a claymore for McIntyre and Ziggler's put down and i get it if this 
kind of 80s reimagining of Hulk Hogan is kind of what we're going for where you know McIntyre's just going to get beat up most of the match and then he makes the big comeback and hits the Claymore and we're done and if that's what we're doing okay but I thought we'd kind of move past that era in wrestling and in the WWE and then also to find out that they're going to have a rematch next week on Raw and I feel like it's going to be the same sequence of events that Ziggler is just going to, you know, get buried and get demolished by Drew McIntyre again next week. So am I in the wrong here? Am I showing, you know, a little bit of maybe my age or, you know, whatever it is? What did you think of Ziggler's performance in the match and the way that he was presented uh, in that match with Drew McIntyre on Sunday? I think his performance was great, but you're not the only one who thought he got buried. He did have a rough time of it. Now, he's put Drew McIntyre over massively, and yeah, he's going to do it all over again. And Dolph's one of those who wants to do that. He's a real leader of late, and he's really shown how important it is to him to be putting other people over. He's been in that role for a long time, and he's worked with Drew so extensively. There's so much respect between the two of them. I do think you're right when you talk about the way Drew McIntyre is winning matches. If they had a crowd... I think at this point he would be starting to get booed because of how definitively he's constantly winning. That said, he's been fighting the right opponents. Rollins, Lashley, Ziggler, even Andrade. Those are the right people to do this with. It won't be the right person when it gets to Randy Orton because Randy Orton would be getting strong cheers right now for being such a good heel. We're at the point now if they actually went ahead with the... or they were able to go ahead with the match in front of a crowd at SummerSlam against Edge... Edge might have been the one getting booed because Orton is getting so much respect right now. So I think McIntyre is burning very bright and it might be worth having him burn out for a little while just to make sure that people are on his side when crowds do return. When it comes to what Dolph does next, I'm not sure. Hopefully Bobby Roode will return and Dolph can go into the tag division. I'm sure he can do good things there. Let's move on to Monday Night Raw and if we thought there were... You know, some rewrites and some last minute additions and some tractions to extreme rules. It sounds like Monday Night Raw was more of the same. We've had reports that there were multiple major rewrites of the show going into Monday Night. What can you tell us about that and about the way that the show had kind of come together, fallen apart, and then they kind of put everything back together again uh, for Monday Night Show? Well, there was a rewrite right after the Extreme Rules rewrites, and can I just say that is a mouthful to get out. There was another rewrite when the WWE realized how many people would be missing from these two Raw tapings. Cruz didn't pass as they initially expected he would right after Extreme Rules, nor did he pass for Raw. Billy Kay was quite obviously missing. I think this is the first time I've ever seen Peyton Royce solo. I mean, I think this is the first time I've ever seen Peyton Royce solo. And there were a number of others missing. And then finally, there was a rewrite of key sections for pickups. That was also part of next week's filming as well. Ric Flair is a notable absence, in my opinion, considering he's been there every week since it all hit the fan, especially with some of the news that's come out about him recently. But it certainly suggests that maybe they don't believe him when he says that he doesn't have it. The first run of the script had Rick interfering in the unsanctioned match. Essentially, the amount of change they have meant that a lot of things had to be written on the fly, I still don't think it was a bad show, though, so maybe it worked out. Yeah, I didn't think it was a terrible show. You know, we we saw some interesting things, you know, one being the return of Ali. Uh, he uh, comes back, uh, appears on Raw, and that was, this is after they did a little bit of hokey pokey. If you've been paying attention to the roster page on WWE.com, you know, he was on SmackDown. Then they kind of quietly moved him over to the Raw side. Then he got switched back over to the SmackDown side. And then here on Monday, he appears as the mystery partner for Ricochet and Cedric Alexander. Any details you can tell us behind the return of Ali and maybe what his role is going to be on the Raw brand going forward? Well, as regards the uh, moving back and forth, there has been a lot of misinformation there. He was moved to Raw, but because once again, the WWE do follow social media... They are aware that people are tracking roster moves by looking at the roster pages. So they left him as a SmackDown member. They just left it. And a few people did get hoodwinked there, which is quite entertaining, I've got to say. I played a few jokes on that one. When it comes to his return, this comes as a result of all of that unavailability. But I personally couldn't be happier for him. 
if there were more people there, I worry he would not have got that chance. And he is someone who deserves to at least be on TV. He's had WWE Championship matches quite recently. So, you know, he got so much momentum on SmackDown and then it just got cut out from under him. On Raw, he took his chance and he got something very good out of it. Everyone else in that match wanted him to be the one to pick up the win. MVP, I have to quote once again, he has a strong voice backstage and I think he's using it right to put people over. I don't know if you can give us any information on this, but I'm just going to ask you because I'm sure people listening to the show are going to want me to ask and have been curious about this. With Ali now being over on Raw, was he supposed to be the hacker over on SmackDown? He was everybody's guess about who that was going to ultimately be revealed as being. And now he's on Raw, and it seems like that even weeks ago, the whole hacker storyline had been dropped completely over on SmackDown. So anything you can tell us in that realm, like was Ali maybe going to be the hacker, then they changed their mind and just dropped it completely and moved him to Raw? Uh, You know, any information you can give our listeners about that storyline? Because that seems to be something I see on social media a lot is people wondering kind of what happened to that storyline and if Ali was supposed to be the guy ultimately behind it. I can actually give quite a lot of information about that. I last month. I think it's more than a month ago now I did a full in-depth analysis of the hacker storyline over on my own personal YouTube channel. In that, I discuss how Ali was the hacker. However, it became too convenient a storyline, and the WWE essentially took it out of his hands. I also go into detail about the origins of GTV back in the day, who that was originally written for, and why it became its own entity instead of the platform for a return of the superstar it was written for now with ali moving to raw it is extremely unlikely we are ever going to see him as the hacker however as long as the hacker storyline is something that the wwe writing team can use to write themselves out of corners there will always be a smackdown hacker well as one person returns and ali it looks like that another person may be officially out the door and done with wwe and that's kari Zane. we've talked a little bit about her on the show in previous weeks about what her contract status is and has been with the wwe what can you tell us about her situation with wwe as of now and if raw was uh the last time that we may see her for a while kari Zane, and i, I say this with great sadness in my heart, Raw was her last date. As we've mentioned here, her contract had expired and had been extended due to time off with injury, so she had a few dates left to fulfill. Those dates are now done. She did film something for next week, to my knowledge, but with what's going on right now and all the changes, we can't be certain it's going to make the cut. If you've been following these podcasts, though, you'll know all about the plan to have her retired by Asuka's SummerSlam opponent. That right now looks like it's going to be Shayna Baszler. We spoke at length about what would happen next last week. This week's Raw only reinforced that. Then lastly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Aleister Black-Seth Rollins match. You know, Aleister Black is a guy who has been on a roll lately, really, since his debut on on the main roster. He seemed to be getting a pretty consistent push. Um, He's a guy that I've advocated for here on the show, that I'm a big fan of his. I, I I think a match between uh, him and Brock Lesnar would be something great to watch. And if you hadn't been aware, Aleister Black, when he lost to Seth Rollins last night on Raw, that was his first one-on-one match that he has lost in a year. And rumors started circulating that maybe the current creative team that is on Raw maybe isn't as high on him as maybe Paul Heyman was when he was in control of Raw, and maybe that had something to do with the Aleister Black loss and the way that he was presented. What can you tell us about Aleister Black and the way that he's perceived in the creative team room, and if this is maybe a sign to come that maybe his push that he was getting may be coming to an end? Well, it was definitely a, a, a big defeat to take, even though it was to a big name like Seth Rollins, and he was slightly protected because of Buddy Murphy's interference. But things have really changed in the last couple of weeks for Alistair Black. Now, Paul Heyman definitely loved him. Alistair Black was really a headline of the show for Paul Heyman. Every week he'd be having a half-hour match in the opening minutes. To my knowledge, it's Vince McMahon that has um, mixed opinions, shall we say, 
Vince added the creak to the entrance when he leverages up. Now he's removed the entrance altogether. We haven't seen the Alistair Black entrance in a long time. To put it bluntly, Vince thinks there is something missing with Alistair Black. It's similar to how he feels with Cesaro. Keep an eye on this one because we all know how that went. Yeah, it's always amazing to me just, you know, the people that Vince kind of gets behind and the people that he does, and there never really seems to be a, a rhyme or reason to it. I mean, I, I think Alistair Black has superstar written all over him, and, and I'm a fan of Cesaro, you know, but you mentioned him, but I think Alistair Black is still a notch above Cesaro when it comes to, you know, charisma and just star factor, and, you know, he's a guy that I want to see um, I didn't mind those 20-minute matches that he was having on Raw. You know, I was very entertained by them. So, you know, it, it, like we said on here on the show before, you know, Vince McMahon is ultimately the judge, jury, and executioner, you know, when it comes to who gets the push and, and what goes on in the company. But this one definitely has me confused. I'm not sure how anyone could look at Aleister Black and not think that he has main eventer written all over him. I agree, but the situation that they have there – for the actual company, really, it's all down to Vince McMahon, and you need to convince that audience of one. Now, I'm not saying Alistair Black doesn't have everything needed to do that. I really think he does. However, the issue we've got, and part of the issue with NXT as sort of the feeder brand at the moment, is that if you've built your gimmick there, that doesn't necessarily mean that Vince McMahon has even seen much of it, let alone being convinced by it. Do you think that because of the lack of live crowds right now that, you know, you mentioned this like with Randy Orton, that he may be a guy that if we have live crowds, he may be getting cheered and maybe vice versa, Drew McIntyre may be getting booed right now if we have live crowds. So do you think that because you don't have those live reactions and you don't have live crowds giving those pops to guys like Aleister Black and, and some of these other guys that could open the eyes maybe of people backstage to really who are these up and coming superstars and who's really getting over with the crowd that because of that Vince McMahon may have a tendency to kind of fall back on the guys that he views as kind of safety nets you know guys like Seth Rollins guys like you know AJ Styles people that he feels like are tried and true guys that are going to you know deliver in the ring and are people that he's comfortable seeing in those main event spots and so maybe the factor of not having live live crowds has kind of put a little bit of a glass ceiling on some of these mid-card and undercard guys as far as them being able to kind of step up to that next level it absolutely has vince mcmahon has confirmed this in conference calls before now that with the lack of live crowd it's hard to tell who's getting over so he does sometimes fall back on old names well, let's take some of your questions that you have for Tom. Uh, we've got questions that came both from YouTube and from Twitter, and so make sure that you are subscribing to the Sports Kita YouTube channel so that you can see when our latest podcast episodes go up. Um, and also on Twitter, uh, you can follow Tom at Collahue, and you can follow me at Corey Guns. And each week when before we record an episode, we reach out to you guys and ask if you have any questions for Tom. Uh, and we might use them on the show. So we've got a couple for you this week, Tom. Uh, first, I want to start with some questions that we got on YouTube from last week's episode. Taymor says, do you know if Dolph Ziggler will be on the SummerSlam card? Right now, he doesn't have a match book to my knowledge. And personally, with how clearly he was beaten by Drew McIntyre, I can't see where he would fit. That's, again, unless Bobby Roode is able to return. Then maybe we could see Viking Raiders versus Street Profits versus Andrade and Gaza versus Ziggler and Roode. I'd watch it. David Lucas on YouTube said, Do you see WWE making changes to any more championship belts? I love the new WWE United States Championship. Right now, no. They've changed a lot of belts recently. The Intercontinental, the United States, the Cruiserweight, the NXT, etc. There is a rumor of a new NXT championship that's slightly bigger because the last title was made for Adam Cole, Alistair Black, Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano. With those in mind, now you have Keith Lee, Karrion Cross, and Dominic Dijakovic at the top of the card. So they've considered making a slightly bigger belt. Outside of that, I don't think we'll see any major changes anytime soon. And then on Twitter, at Jermaine Presley asked uh, a two-parter that I think is pretty interesting. Is WWE still holding off on Sasha versus Bayley for SummerSlam? 
And if they are, is there a possibility of a Sasha versus Stephanie match? Kind of a hashtag legit boss versus the boss. As regards SummerSlam, there are no plans at the moment to have Sasha Banks versus Bailey, to my knowledge. I think we're too close to the event now for them to pull the trigger. We get three weeks of actual build at most, and that doesn't do this feud justice, in my opinion. This, because they've kept trying to push it and then pulling back from it, has been a very, very long-built match. So they need to take their time with it, and I just don't think they have enough. As regards Stephanie McMahon, I would say there is no chance whatsoever of that match happening anytime soon. Stephanie McMahon has not been to the Performance Centre at all since COVID kicked in, and she won't be coming in. She also apparently respects that she might not be able to keep pace with someone like Sasha Banks. I respect that position. That's not to say she can't get uh, get herself into a position where she could do that. Stephanie McMahon, to my knowledge, has always trained extremely well, particularly in wrestling. She actually, to my knowledge, was not a bad wrestler at all and could d- definitely carry a match. But we would see how that worked out against someone as experienced and talented as Sasha Banks, of course. I can't see the match happening at any point. We appreciate everybody sending in their questions. And like I said, if you want to get involved in the show and have your questions answered by Tom, uh, make sure that you like and comment on this week's video over at the Sports Kita YouTube channel. And you can find your opportunity there and also on Twitter to ask questions for next week's episode. Uh, as I mentioned, you can follow Tom at Collihue and you can follow me at Corey Guns on Twitter. Also, make sure that you're subscribing to Tom's personal YouTube channel as well. He talks about even more wrestling news and notes. You heard him reference some of those in today's episodes, um, and he's usually one of the first guys with the news. So make sure that you're subscribing to his YouTube channel as well uh, so that you're up to date on everything going on in the wrestling world. And you can also check out SportsKeeda.com for the latest wrestling news and articles as well. We thank you guys for listening this week, and we will see you next time on the next episode of Dropkick Discussions.